Good morning. Thank you for watching the uh, Casey Auction video blog today. I'm excited to bring you bring to you our guest, uh, who's an historian, appraiser, and a good friend of mine, Charles Keller, ISA. And uh, before I turn the mic over to Charles, Charles is an amazing man. He works for a lot of auction houses in the area. He does appraisals. He has been quoted uh, in the BBC. He's been he's consulted with major museums, World War One here in town, Smithsonian's. Uh, the Imperial War Museum. He's been asked to verify sources for the New York Times and many more. Um, he works with the H.G. Wells Society, which is a fascinating thing to me. And uh, I've been happy. I've been fortunate to have him in my circle of friends and colleagues in Kansas City for many, many years. Charles, before we get started on the questions that we talked about, why don't you tell me and people watching what interested you in, in appraisals, in history, and in pursuing the career that you've done to get to the point we're at today? Well, when I started, <laughs> it goes back to when I was an undergrad and I had been working for a physics degree and I got through Calc 2 and realized this wasn't going to work anymore. I needed to find another, yeah, calculus, everybody knows what cal <laughs> it's not exactly the easiest thing in the world. So I was looking around for another field to go into and I had always had a talent for the past. I was always interested in it. And... Uh, I saw a course on the history of astronomy and I've been an astronomer since 1975. So I'm like, well, that's for me. So I went in, I took that class and I realized history is something I'd really like to pursue. So I got my degree in, in history, came out of, out of, of, out of university. I was looking around for jobs. I didn't want to teach. I even went back to my mentor professor who had described himself as a neo-Marxist. And he said, don't go into academia. It's just don't do it. So I took his advice and stayed in the in the private sector, and I took a job in the late 90s with Mannion's International Auction House, and the, the company specialized in historical military, all eras, all nations, and also into natural history and general collectibles. Well, I came in and started working with the American uh, military stuff, and then segued into Imperial Germany and then General European. Um, and so I was, I was there for eight years and saw an astonishing array of, of, uh, of artifacts. And you know, the whole point at an auction house is you get the items, you, you authenticate them, you, write the, the, you do the research, you write the descriptions, uh, you sell them. Um, and there is a certain amount of, of historical acumen you have to have. You have to understand historiography and historical method um, so you can properly contextualize things especially items that are sensitive. And I think that's something we're going to talk about later. Um, and so I worked with all these items for about eight years. And after I left that company and worked for a couple of others that uh, brought me into more fine arts, practical arts. Um, and of course, my work with the H.G. Wells Society, uh, obviously books was a, a field of mine. I've attended the Rare Book School at the University of Virginia, did their ridiculously difficult course on descriptive bibliography. It's like learning another language. Um, I thought it was going to be easy. Well, so anyway, books are another uh, area of mine um, and something I see as an appraiser. And generally, you know, when, when it comes to books, we're talking about the hand-pressed era. We're talking 1450 to 1800. Although a lot of calls are from 19th century books that people think are valuable or rare and I think we're going to talk about what rarity actually means a little bit later too. So I'll, I'll skip that. But anyway, that's that's my background. I became an appraiser because it's just an outcropping of being a an auctioneer. When you as an auctioneer go and review a collection someone has, and you're giving pre-auction estimates, 
it's easier for you because it's a range of numbers. Whereas with an appraisal, you're trying to put, putting a fine point on something, whether it's for insurance or whether it's uh, documenting a non-cash charitable contribution. I mean, you're expected to put a fine point on it. Um, so being an appraiser focuses what an auctioneer does and uh, is, is a bit more precise, but it also allows someone like me with an historical background that loves to do that kind of thing. It allows me to really so uh, that's how that's how I got into appraising. <laughs> Very cool. And you're right. You know, there are so many different values. We get calls every day, as I'm sure you do. What's this worth? I want an appraisal on this. Um, and defining what that person needs is so crucial to yeah. performing whatever task they need correctly. Um, yeah, that's a, that's the first thing you do as an appraiser is you need to define what is the intended use. They can tell you what they think their intended use is. But you are the one that actually defines that for them. And when they sign off on that, like, yeah, I need, I'm settling an insurance claim or I need to obtain insurance or, you know, I'm donating this or the family's going to split up all these things and we need values. So it's fair. Um, that's, you know, that's the function of, the, of an appraiser. Yeah. And a lot of people don't realize no matter how much you and I or other people talk about, there are clearly defined areas of appraisal. Um, and you're right. People just have this idea of either the roadshow appraisal or yeah. something that they do on their jewelry. Right. Um, and and so that's the fun thing about when, when you and I do the, the KCPT uh, appraisal fair, that's fun because people come in and they're as often looking for background history. What is this thing really? It's funny that value is almost secondary to at least a lot of the people that I've worked with at the fair. And I love that. That's the fun part. I, when people are curious about the intellectual content of what they have, and I think we're going to get into that, what what constitutes value and, and what's provenance. But um, that's that's the, the most fun part of, of, the, of those appraisal fairs. Now, when, every once in a while you get somebody that goes, well, I really want to know what this is worth. And you're like, okay, well, these quick and dirty evaluations that we still have to do according to USPAP. Oh, okay, well... <laughs> <laughs> it's, always an adventure. it's always an adventure, isn't it? Yeah, well, that's that's we refer to the to the auctioneer sitting next to you because that because we can give a completely different range and not expose ourselves to any kind of blowback on that. And that's that's exactly what I do as well. Uh, when when it comes down to what is this thing worth, that's where I can say, well, if you sell it here, here's a range of numbers. This is a pre-auction estimate. And you could take this to three different auctioneers and they may give you a different range. This is my opinion. This is ba based on my experience in this quick and dirty. I've got my laptop set up with, with uh, Wi-Fi. <laughs> this is this yeah. is what the market's telling me right now. It's quick and dirty. It's it's nothing that you would yeah. hang your hat on. Certainly nothing that you would use officially since appraisals are quasi-legal documents and they require, they require to be locked down. You know, and yeah, they're more than quasi-legal. They're kind of legal documents. I mean, yeah, I mean, ISA, ISA uses quasi-legal as as their is their phrase. So I, I've adopted that. That's good enough. But you're absolutely right. I mean, appraisals are they are used by the IRS. They're used in in court proceedings. I mean, yeah, they Reverse you can get in trouble for doing it wrong. Absolutely. <laughs> um, just so I remember, I got Charles Keller. We're talking about histor historical documents, history, appraisals, and so on. If you have questions, ask them below. We'll get to them as soon as we can. So obviously you talked about books a lot. You have a huge library behind you and I'm sure that's not your entirety of a library. And you mentioned mm -hmm. books in particular. Um, what, so what makes, we talked about items, but what makes a book, you talked about the, the, the hand printing versus you know, mass production. When from a historical standpoint, from a estate appraisal or liquidation standpoint, what really makes a book antique versus old versus valuable? And I know we don't have days to talk about this, but you know, <laughs> in, yeah. in the in, in the realm of this conversation, you know, what do you think? What's what's some of your thoughts on that? Well, technically, antique means a hundred years or older. Um, we know we have wiggle room on either side of that. Uh, when it, what I like to focus on is, like I said earlier, the hand pressed era, fourteen fifty to eighteen hundred, where it wasn't mechanized and paper was handmade and everything was bound um, by a very special process that it was clearly defined. And so 
when you're dealing with books from that era, you're almost an archaeologist. You're looking at the you're looking at the the, the physical characteristics of the book. Uh, someone like myself can look at a book from the era, and I can tell you how it was assembled. Um, how big were the original sheets? What, how were they cut down? I can explain all that to you. And every time I do that to clients, their their minds are blown. And it's simply because that era is the most windswept and interesting era of book production. When you get into the 19th century where the, the paper is machine made and the process was much more automated, uh, you can have valuable books from that era. Certainly you can. I mean, it's the era of Dickens. It's um, you know, there's so many different uh, touchstone authors and works that, uh, you know, from the Bronte sisters, whatever, uh, that are, that still inform the present day. But um, those books are, uh, like, those books are, they're, they're easy to appraise. They're not necessarily less interesting the hand, than the hand-pressed era, but like I said, that hand-pressed era is just, it's romantic as can be. And especially when you explain how a book is put together and people can walk through the process with you and go, oh my gosh, I had no idea what, what this little code meant. You know, that's a lot of fun for me because, you know, I'm, I'm, like I said, I have a degree in history and I don't want to teach, but actually kind of do. And that's one thing I get to do as an appraiser is I get to share my passion, my love for history uh, through the items that someone has. Yeah, you talk about the difference between the hand pressed and the, the machine made. It's like it's like in the art world, a painting versus a print. Absolutely. There are Absolutely. certain yeah. things that can never come through and be portrayed, even in a book uh, that's got the the, 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 sewn, the sewn bindings and all those kinds of things, the hand handmade paper um, mm -hmm. that, that just do not translate in any other style or type of book. So right. that's very, right. very cool. Um, so another broad question, because, you know, like, like you and I talked about before, history is a big time. You know, you can't talk about you know, billions of years and, and, and minutes. But generally speaking, when somebody calls you and says, I have an historical document or letter, what makes a letter document archive historical or not? Um, and how much does that affect interest value and, and things along those lines? Well, the historiosity of an item can yeah, have that's a fun word. Effect. I heard <laughs> yeah. Historiosity. I yeah, like that. historiosity. Yeah, uh, it it can have a significant impact on value. And uh, for myself, when someone calls that I don't know them from Adam, they they say they've got something. My default position is skepticism. Okay, you have this. Well, it, it, like. A, Almost 20 years ago, I got a call from a guy when I worked at Mannion's, and he said, I've got one of Saddam Hussein's uniforms. And I'm like, sure you do. Tell me about it. And he told me his story, how he was a sergeant in the 3rd Infantry Division, and his patrol, immediate patrol, was around the Saddam Hussein International Airport. And Saddam had a palace. So he told me this story. And I'm listening to this going, okay, maybe. So send me some photos. So he sent me some photos and uh, he began to crack my facade because at first I'm like, no, there's no way. No, no, there, there, no, uh -uh, no. Uh, and eventually when he sent it in, I, I was the one that authenticated it. And at, at the time, of course, there was no frame of reference for any kind of Iraqi things apart from maybe Republican Guard stuff that came out of the first Gulf War. Um, certainly nothing about Saddam himself himself, excuse me. Um, and so I looked at this thing for its intrinsic and extrinsic characteristics and properties, and I, you know, I authenticated it. And yes, I went out on a limb. Um, but the, my reasoning was inductive. It was, I'm looking for things that both confirm and would seem to deny the authenticity of this item. Because if this thing is actually authentic, it's special because it's connected to this hyper bad guy that uh, that you know that the coalition had overthrown. Um, I find you know I, I finally found enough evidence to say okay I think this is real, and uh, the, the market agreed because I did I did my due diligence, um, and then lo and behold over the next couple of years until the I guess it was the Pentagon said okay guys no more war trophies. 
uh, some other things did come out of the the former Iraqi regime that were just like what Saddam had. And so if someone had been, someone had made this with the intent to fool, um, it wouldn't have looked like all these others. And right. so I was, uh, I was, I can't say exonerated because nobody, nobody accused me of, of getting it wrong, <laughs> but I was certainly confirmed in, in what I said. So, you know, the, the, the historiosity of, of the item is vitally important. Um, and it's, you become kind of a Sherlock Holmes in history where you're, you're looking for uh, evidence, pro and con, and then you weigh it, all of it. And, you know, you may be using deductive reasoning, you're using inductive reasoning, um, an inductive, maybe you're calling in another expert or two or three experts and putting all of their opinions together. Um, because if this item is historically significant, the market may hold it in higher esteem and be willing to pay more for it. And so if I'm doing an appraisal for insurance, my client needs to be properly insured. Um, or if they've lost the item, um, you know, they need to be properly compensated. If they're making a donation, it needs to be accurate. It needs to be a fair market value. Um, so these are, these are all elements of, of what I do, the historiosity of an item affects. Um, yeah, there's your answer. <laughs> answer. And I love the historiosity. I just made a banner for it. I'll throw it on the screen. I don't know if you can see that or not. But <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. that's a great word. I've not heard that before, so I'm pretty excited. <laughs> I learned a new word today in my show. Um, you talked a lot there, and I want to unwrap a little bit of what you talked about and kind of bring it into a question we had that, uh, we talked about what's the importance of the provenance and our documentation, but that ties directly into the authentication that you talked about. Um, kind of tell people, because one of the things that we get contacted about regularly, and I'm sure you do as well, is authenticating a piece versus appraising it, um, which oftentimes is easy. Other times it's near impossible. Um, what, do you, what kind of ideas or tips can you give people watching this to help with that authentication process mm -hmm. that ties into the provenance and history and documentation right. and how important those, those attributes really are to the value of something. Right. Provenance is the history of origin and ownership. Yeah. Yeah, simply um, it's, and again, it speaks, like you said, directly to the authenticity of an item. Now as an appraiser, if someone calls me and says, I've got, uh, I've got a, a stool that, that Granny Maybell said George Washington once tripped over this. Um, my job is going to be, obviously they want me to appraise it as a stool that George Washington tripped over. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not going to take their word for it without watertight provenance. Right. Um, and an appraisal is not an authentication. And as a member of the International Society of Appraisers, I am not allowed to both authenticate and appraise an item, one or the other. Now, when it comes to doing an appraisal, I'm not going to appraise something as a stool that George Washington once tripped over if the readily apparent identity doesn't speak strongly enough to that. I regularly advise clients with exotic items that look, I can appraise it as this, this, or this, but if you want it as this, you need to go have an authentication done. That opens another can of worms. Where do I go? Well, that's, that's, you know, it's, it's a level of difficulty that every, every, <laughs> every issue or every, every item is different. Um, but uh, that's basically it. I will appraise something according to its readily apparent identity. And if I think there's enough evidence, if it's just clearly 100% and in my experience and known to the market as this sort of thing, yeah, there's there's no problem authenticating or I'm, I'm appraising it as as well, what the client said it is. But again, when I work with historical stuff, it's usually not. I can't say usually, but it's often not so well defined, and right. it requires it requires. I almost become a counselor with clients sometimes, like walking them through it. What does this mean? What? How do I do this? And what effect will it have? And if I don't think that an authentication is going to help their case. I'm not going to spend their money on it. I'm not going to tell them to spend their money on it. I'm going to save them a step and go, you know, I, in my experience, I really don't think this is 
whatever. This is this is a widget that that was Napoleon's. I don't I don't really think that. Um, you're welcome, and I encourage you to get other opinions that we could take on board and, and reconsider later. But that's my opinion, and you know, send them on their way. Yeah, and it's 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 always nice when you can immediately discount these tr watching the tripping over it um, because of factors of the object, like a stool. If it's a machine-made stool, there's no way that George Washington tripped over it, right? Um, and yeah, oftentimes people don't, people don't think about that, and they think about the story and, well, Grandma had it, so it had to be old. Um, yeah, Granny Mabel's always said that this was blah, 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 you know? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think that was a way to keep you quiet at the dinner table. Um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I've, uh, gone into, I've gone into situations where notes have been attached to items that uh, have actually said, if you break this, I'm going to kill you. I, I'm not even kidding. <laughs> I haven't seen that note yet, but I've seen about every other type of note attached yeah. to an antique or family heirloom piece that uh, oftentimes has more uh, importance to the person writing the note than it will ever have to anybody else. Well, and, and that's that's a, a, an excellent point to make. Uh, we're talking about sentimental value at that point. And um, the, the sentimental value really has next to no bearing on actual monetary value. And that's where my job as an appraiser, like going back to establishing what's the intended use, why do they actually need this? I can define very quickly whether the client is just looking for information, solving a family mystery, confirming family lore, um, or if the item is actually worth a lot of a lot more further a lot more study um a lot more detail study i guess is what i should say um yeah so yeah and it's interesting also how the market responds to certain things at certain times absolutely um, and, and that's why we encourage people to re-up their appraisals every five years markets are volatile and we have no idea what the effect on the market is going to be from what we're going through now I mean, in the in the coming years, assuming we get COVID under control in the next year or so, I mean, by 2022, you have to look at the market for all of our valuables and go, okay, what happened? Absolutely. And, and honestly, what we're seeing as an auction company is that prices, if anything, on higher middle grade to better quality things is better than it was pre-COVID. Yeah, and, and that's... I think there was a bit of a reflection of that during the last financial crisis because, I mean, let's be honest, rich people don't participate in recessions. So Generally not, no. for them, it's it's an opportunity to buy low. And if even if things aren't falling in price, they're still going to snap up items because – and they're competing with one another, but they're going to get items that uh, that it's just, there's less competition for them. Um, yeah. and, uh, the, it's just, it's a boon for them. And we, during the last financial crisis it, in, in the, the rarefied air of, of the upper art industry, there was no change when you're selling yeah. a Picasso, when you're selling a Van Gogh, you got a Rembrandt. I mean, it's not good. You're not going to see much of a fluctuation. It is possible. You can see, you can see a bit of a fluctuation, but nothing that's like a greater trend. Yeah, and usually those fluctuations at that level are more along the lines of somebody is just out of the collecting market for whatever reason. Right. And so the one or two that drove the price hard are not bidding anymore. But we've been at, we're, you know, I would call us a, a mid, -lane, mid range auction house. We've had several auctions during COVID, and our bidder participation and lot views and prices are all as strong, if not stronger, than they were in January and February when this wasn't even talked about. So, Right. It's really, it's really interesting. There's, it's obviously a big concern, the larger financial implication that we are facing. But as of now, like we're selling things, we're selling good quality furniture for thousands of dollars when we didn't even have to get hundreds of dollars for six months ago. Right. Um, I think it's, I think it's a reflection of consumer confidence, which we know is kind of holding steady at the moment. Um, yes. So, you know, and, and I can, Confirm what you're saying from what I see, you know, from the upper range, the Sotheby's, the Christie's, they're all reporting great auctions. Um, and all the way down through, like you said, the, the midlines, it's still doing all right. And uh, I'm encouraged. 
Yeah, yeah, I am too. Um, I think part of the reason is people are sitting in front of their computers right now doing, you know, working at home and, and looking at their surroundings and thinking about, yes. <laughs> My wife actually is, so if she's watching, she would not really be right there. <laughs> Tony, um, it's a work, it's a work. <laughs> um, so another thing that's happened recently, we have COVID and Corona, which has changed our everybody's um, abilities to, to function normally, which has brought upon other conversations that our country is going through right now, mainly race issues. And that's a really huge topic, historically speaking, and not just race, but politic, politics, um, geopolitical, all those kinds of things. How do you work? And we you know, we see these kinds of topics and in, in artifacts regularly. Um, I'm sure you do as well. How do you talk to families, talk to potential clients about historically sensitive documents, archives, items like a Saddam Hussein, you know, uniform? That's you know, that's a very divisive uh, divisive object to some people. Um, you know, how do yeah, how do you talk would about you that? ever want to own that? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, how do you how do you broach that with clients, and how do you see the public responding to certain things like that, um, both short term and of course historically speaking? Yeah, uh, very sensitively. Uh, um, when you're dealing with something that came out of the past, let's say a defeated ideology, that um, and obviously we're talking a lot about uh, 20th century items in the market. Those are what you find most commonly, and. Quite frankly, I mean, when it comes to historical artifacts, the bad guy stuff is always a little bit more desired by collectibles because they're the bad guys. Um, and so when these things get passed on to a younger generation with you know, different sensitivities and different perceptions, um, it's important for myself as an historian who's worked with these items for you know, more than 20 years to make sure they understand these items aren't zombies. They're not going to come back to life and they're not going to enslave you. They're not going to kill you, blah, blah, blah. They're just, they're representations of a defeated ideology and there is value in them. And so you either need to protect them with insurance because they're now part of family lore or um, most of the time people with those things want to sell them and they feel guilty about selling them, but they really shouldn't because the, the, the issue that I have with, it's one of the most one of the most common things I hear is when somebody sees something out in the public sphere that is windswept and interesting, the most common thing, well, that belongs in a museum. Well, does it really? And how do you know that there aren't a lot of those already in museums? And how do you know there's enough real estate in museums to house every single one of these things that you would deem necessary to go in a museum? And how do you know there's enough money to administer all these things over the long term. There's something to be said for the private collector world in shepherding items for, for the rest of us. Uh, there are things that, you know, the, the, some of those valuable things in the world were never made to be collected. Um, they just became collectible. And so, there is a role for private collectors to take care of history while the vast majority of us aren't paying any attention. I mean, I've seen it in, especially in the historical military world, where trench art from World War I for decades was one of the least popular things. It was old shell casings that the French and the Belgians would take back to their factories and twist and hammer and make little pieces of art and sell them back to the troops. As nobody cared about that stuff for years. And then gradually over time, you know, we talked about it before, the, the rise and fall of, of, of certain kinds of collectibles. Um, things come into vogue and then fall out of vogue. Um, now they're, they're really, really popular. Um, and the, their prices, when I see what a piece of trench art's going for now, I'm like, are you kidding me? You couldn't have gotten $5, $5. for that 20 years ago. <laughs> so, um, yeah. It's just important for people to understand that, and it, it takes courage it, to, to face history and it, with a fair mind, see history for what it was. Um, but, you know, when I, when I was a his, uh, history undergrad, day one in historiography class, the first thing the professor said is there are a few rules 
to being an historian. And the first one is thou shalt not judge historical persons, places, or events by current values and mores. Wow. Now, most historians break that rule. And obviously, a lot of journalists break that rule, but journalists aren't actually historians. They like to pretend they are, but they're not. Journalists do the roughest first draft, and then historians are left to, to actually do the real work. Um, the, the, we do a lot of that in our culture. And there's an argument to, me, to be made we always have because we're human. And we're subject to same foibles and misunderstandings as the next guy. Um, but when it comes to, and I know, what you, I know what you're getting at when you're talking about in the public sphere. I mean, we're talking about you know, removing statues. And I've been vocal for years about removing Confederate statues to battlefields, museums, um, and, and cemeteries where these things can be properly contextualized. Because... There's a, a point where an item's highest and best use becomes education. And that's what I want to see happen to them. Um, obviously, I didn't get my way. And there's a lot of things being torn down and destroyed right now. Um, it's, it, it's just, it just happens. I mean, yeah. there's some historians like myself that look back on the, the burning and the destruction of the library at Alexandria in, in the 7th century AD. And I still get foggy about it. Like, why did that have to happen? The, the, the damnatio memoriae idea, let's erase history, let's destruction of memory. That's, that's what can come of, of overreacting to an historical piece that would really be better consecrated to knowledge and to education. We should be handing these things on to our next generations so they understand what they are, what they meant, what they meant in this era, too, because that is now a part of the provenance and the history of whatever the item is we're talking about. So uh, all of these things should be judiciously and soberly recorded and preserved for the future. Uh, yeah, I push back a little bit on that, though. We don't have st sculpture, statues, and monuments to Hitler or to other historically evil people. Um, but we have the monuments of Auschwitz and the, 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 the remains of the actions that they did uh, is much more powerful and important. And well, you're wrong not, about that. You're wrong about that. There, oh. are, there are sculptures of Hitler and Himmler and Goebbels uh, that I have seen through the years. They don't exist in the public sphere. No, absolutely not. Right. Maybe, they'll be, maybe they'll be in a museum. But I remember when I worked at Mannion's, this old grizzled World War II vet walks in with a bronze Hitler bust and he had been using it as a boat anchor since the end of the war. And he's like, I just found out that this is valuable and my wife's got cancer or something like that and I need to sell it. And so these things do actually exist. They're just being looked after by the, by the private market. And eventually those things are going to end up in museums because the guy's going to die. The family's not going to want it. They're going to donate it somewhere. So those things do exist. Now, the, the public display of, of disquieting things, I mean, we can go overboard, and we are going overboard really quickly. You know, we want yeah. to remove George Washington now. We want to remove the Emancipation Memorial. Um, it, to me, it's a fundamental misreading of history. And the other, the other part of, of the, the issue that I have is we talk about removing it, but there's no end game. Where are you going to remove it to? It's not like you can just wave a magic wand and it goes away. Where yeah. is it going? How is it going to be looked after? How is it going to be contextualized? And again, highest and best use of something. If you want to remove it because it offends current sensibilities, I get that. Just make sure you have a plan for it. Because what right do we have to completely erase something from the, from the historical record? You know, I, I think back to ancient Egypt after the reign of Akhenaten, Amenhotep IV. They did a very good job of erasing him from history. And it wasn't until the 20th century that we were able to back into his existence after Carter discovered Tutankhamun's tomb. It took us years to figure out and, and, and plug this hole in the historical record of the pharaonic era. Um, what gave him the right to do that? I mean, it was, it was, it was a religious fervor, of course, because of the, of the, the religious and, and political things that Akhenaten did. Um, but it crippled our understanding of history. It's a little like in, in archaeology and antiquities. 
we discourage the removal of items from their original place because it destroys their original context. And what right do we have to do that? It, after the Taliban took over in, in, uh, in Afghanistan, they destroyed the Armenian Buddha statues because it offended their current sensibilities. They took away something from all of humanity, from our collective memory that I feel they had no right to do. Um, yeah. So, it's, yeah, we've got to be very careful and judicious and, again, courageous and understand that there are things in the past that are disquieting, offensive, and need to be contextualized very carefully and very honestly. And it, it's going to require courage from everybody. Yeah. I want to thank, uh, we've had several people watching. Paige Troop brought up an interesting point. I don't know if you can see that on the question there. She collects murderabilia in lacy pieces. Mm -hmm. um, how do you, and this is a, 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 a strange, real, almost niche market. How do you find appraisers for something that just isn't in the common sphere, right? That's, yeah. um, you know, that's a really small world. And, yeah. and Paige asked the question, so I yeah. appreciate that. And if others yeah. have questions, please ask them below. But how does Paige or other people who collect areas that are really, really, really small, how do you appraise that? It's a great question and one that I get quite often. Because, I mean, as appraisers, we nobody appraises everything. We all define who we are and what we do. Um, so the answer is networking. <laughs> you have to reach out to multiple appraisers and say, I have this and expect them to go, I can't help you with that, but maybe you can try this, this, and this. I mean, it's going to require some patience and diligence, um, but even in murderbilia, yeah, there's going to be a, there's a, there's a market for it. You've just got to find the, the right appraiser. <laughs> it's going to be, it's a tall order. I don't, I don't know who you're going to go to uh, for that. There's nobody specializing in that, but like, no, said, not, not that I know of. That's a, when I look at the ISA and ASA and AAA website, I don't, I don't see anybody with murderabilia <laughs> on, their, on their resume. But there are definitely people who collect it. I mean, I, I've yeah. seen sales results of Gacy and I'm yeah. drawing a blank on others right now. Um, and but again, it's the bad guy. It's the bad guy thing. People are attracted to the dark side. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they ascribe or, or prescribe to, to, uh, to the values that gave rise to whatever those things are. It's just that the bad guys are kind of interesting. And just... I, it's just the way the way things are, the way things have always been. People collected Napoleon stuff in the 19th century, you know, right. and at the time he was considered the Antichrist. Um, so, it, and, and Akhenaten, go back to him, ancient Egypt. I mean, after he died, he was the least popular thing in the world. Um, but now we'd give anything for more Akhenaten stuff uh, right. because it allows us to properly record and contextualize our collective human history. Absolutely. Charles, thanks so much for joining me today. Before I close, are we done already? We just started. <laughs> I know this, this is this is like a long weekend away kind of conversation, right? We could talk about these things for hours. Yeah, we were going for all, almost forty minutes now, which is hard to believe. Um, before I wrap up the show, uh, I like to give all my guests the last you know thirty seconds, three minutes, five minutes. We talked about a lot, but there are a lot of things that we did not talk about. Is there anything you want to share with people about what you do, um, what you see in the market, what excites you about what the appraisal industry is doing or not, uh, or, or things that can be approved, or just anything at all you want to say because you got some people watching you? <laughs> okay. Uh, don't be afraid of history. Uh, like I said, approach it with courage. Realize that the three dimensional representations of this, of the past, are not zombies. They're not going to hurt you. Uh, and the best thing you can do is to properly contextualize these things based on what you think on whatever it is. Uh, it's, it's important for you to pass it on properly contextualized um, in terms of how, it, I guess, how I can help. I mean, you can check my website, see what I do. Again, if you have murderabilia and you don't know who to go to, um, I might be able to point you in a direction, but I don't really know anybody that does that kind of thing, that kind of thing. Um, but uh, in terms of the appraisal industry, I think we're going in the right direction. We're dealing with um, a lot of legal issues right now. Um, 
we're in a state of flux with tax law that will affect uh, wealthier estates uh, and have until now. And I think I think there's a sea change coming that's going to have a massive effect on on estates uh, in the coming five to ten years. So I think that the appraisal industry is is doing very well. Um, defining boundaries and setting standards um, and advocating on behalf of appraisers. Yeah, I think those are all good things. And you're right. I think that uh, as, as we just continue to progress as a society, there are going to be many, many changes. Thank Always you so are. Much. <laughs> yeah. Every, every, every day there's changes, right? Um, yeah. and, sometimes, and sometimes we seem, they seem to move faster than other times, but uh, you know, Two years ago, doing an interview like this was not even a real possibility at the level of income that my company has. Um, and so technology changes, society changes, people change, geography changes. I mean, everything um, changes, and the only constant is that. So thank you guys so much. Thank you so much, Charles, for joining me today. I'm going to put your uh, information here. Charles, like I said, has an incredible va background in this industry. If you need an appraisal of anything at all, but specifically historic items, um, documents, ephemera, books, all of those kinds of things. You go to his website, charleskiller.net. Even uh, artwork. <laughs> what's that? Even artwork. <laughs> Even artwork, absolutely. Art and antiques, yeah. absolutely. The only thing I don't think you try to do is a, you don't do much jewelry, I don't think. I don't but, do any uh, jewelry. We know who does that. <laughs> yeah, Tracy last week, and she was she was awesome. And, and yeah, see, that, was, that was really good. I really enjoyed that one. Excellent. Uh, if you want to contact Charles, it's Charles R. Keller at gmail.com and his number is 816-289-5400. That will all be all the things that we do and say, uh, let me just one more thing. Well said, yes, Paige, Paige uh, appreciated what you said there about uh, not forgetting history. And I think we all do. That's such an important, important thing to remember as we progress as a society. Thank everybody so much for watching today. And uh, where's my banners at? Thank you, here we go. Uh, the KC Auction video blog. I am Jason Roski, the host and the owner of the KC Auction Appraisal Company. You can always ask us questions below. Send us a direct message. Email us at info at kcauctioncompany.com, whether it's questions about what you see in these videos and our shows or questions you have about appraisals, antiques, or estate auctions. Give us a phone call at 816-283-3633. And again, thank you all so much for watching. Appreciate it. Uh, I will be, uh, and uh, David uh, Schillen, thank you so much for watching. Uh, I will be on vacation next week. I'll run a replay of something, but um, I will be out of Wi-Fi signal down at the Ozarks. I am pretty excited about that. Actually, it's been a while since I've been able to uh, disconnect from any kind of um, uh, cell phones or anything. It's like we're going to be in a, in a cabin on a lake, and the only thing we get to watch tonight is the fireflies and uh, whatever DVDs we get to bring with. Thank you all so much for watching. If you have any questions, let us know. Charles, again, thank you so much for joining us. And we will, where is my, you know, when you get a new toy, it takes a while to figure it all out. Thank you all so much for watching. Have a great afternoon, and we'll talk to you next week.